they have the option. They can pass it on to sales or they can write it themselves. And here's what's funny when you're. Everybody, thank you so much for being on the show here. Josiah Hartley, thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, it's been uh, really awesome getting to know you through uh, Facebook Messenger. It's awesome always connecting to some uh, agents that are doing some big things. How are you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. I uh, appreciate you having me. And yeah, I know we connected over uh, Facebook. I had heard your name and we started kind of exchanging ideas. So happy to be here. Yeah, I want to share with everybody how awesome you're doing for being... um, You just had your one-year anniversary with Farmers? Uh, We're coming up. We are 10 months in. So actually, we're two months away from being at our one-year mark. So almost there. Awesome. Man, but you're off to a hot start. Um, But yeah, why don't we get right into it? You know, tell me about your background. Start with the early days. (laughs) And uh, yeah, let me know how you got in the insurance business. I know you went with Allstate uh, for a few years there. Mm -hmm. And then um, you came to Farmers. But yeah, where'd you grow up and um, what got you in the insurance business? <laughs> so I grew up, I'm in uh, Houston, Texas. So I grew up at a s- small town close by called Alvin, a little more like rural, like country town. And I've always lived around the area. Um, I got into insurance. I was actually uh, managing a gym at the time and personal training clients. And one of the, the clients that came there was an Allstate agent, a large 30-year Allstate agent. And I was like, had a young kid at the time and I was killing myself working 17, 18 hour days. And he was like, you should get licensed and go into insurance. I'll kind of help guide you. So I did. And he kind of pointed me on the direction, introduced me to some people at Allstate and I was able to buy an agency there. So um, I was with Allstate for a total of three years, bought an agency in our second year. Um, I built out a scratch agency. We grew it from about six million in premium to thirteen and a half over three years, oh, and wow. then I sold both of those, and then I came to Farmers almost a year ago now. So, oh wow! So you before uh, going to Austin, you were just your work uh, gym trainer. <laughs> yeah, it was like a com- completely different career field. I had uh, no idea what I was doing. I took over. Uh, I remember it was in October uh, of 2017, and. Um, I remember like the first month I was just figuring out how to like transfer the power to my name. You know, I I had no idea what I was doing. So. Wow. How long were you doing the uh, training for gym training? I did that for about five years. I was training people and then working way up to to management there. So I uh, opened and closed the gym, um, kind of ran it um, for clientele and then had like a select group of clients I personal trained as well. Okay, cool. Did that experience you think translate a little bit to it you know. did from like the people side you know like a lot of even what i do today is um the personal side of things it's like the relational right it's um whether it's clients or like your team members like being able to have like high eq like the soft skills mm-hmm. um working with people getting them to be able to trust you open up to you have conversations be vulnerable coach mentor uh, a lot of that is in personal training or the gym side and i think a For lot sure. of that translates to working with team members keeping them in a good headspace that sort of thing yeah and then you have to be motivated you have to be disciplined <laughs> you know be the energizer bunny <laughs> yeah yeah you got to be the example you know if you want to train somebody you got to be in good shape and stuff like that yeah. so um yeah the mindset um, put in the work. There's a lot of uh, things that, um, you know, to build a body, you know, same thing when it comes to building an agency. The hours are a lot easier. I used to open the gym. I had to open it at 4.30. So I laugh sometimes now we open at 8.30 and you might be like, oh, we'd be there at 8.30. I'm like, I used to be there at 4.30. This is late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Physically, it's a little bit easier of a job too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the, other, the thing about the gym business is you had to be there to be making money. And the beauty of the insurance business is you're building something you scale. It has recurring revenue over time, and it becomes a machine that it makes you money when you're not even there. So that was just so attractive. Right. So at the Allstate situation, did you ever work for that agency or just boom, started off? No, no. I right? um, It was pretty crazy how it happened. Um, I literally found a person who was looking to retire. They want to retire fast. I was negotiating it while I was doing my training. I had to go to Chicago. They had in-person training at that time. I was negotiating it. I hadn't even met the employees until the day I actually owned it to go. (laughs) I just showed up and I was like, hi. Um, So it was pretty crazy. (laughs) And you didn't really have insurance experience. No, no. And so it took us a month 
one was just figuring out how to get everything working. Um, it took about three months to figure out how to start getting new business in the door. We sort of like testing out internet leads and things by month three. It was like December. I actually remember it was December. We wrote like 32 new business items and I was like freaking thrilled. You know, it was me and a couple of reps in there. And we like, we had put 30 items on the board, you know, it was a huge one. I was like, oh my gosh, we can actually get new clients, you know, but it took like th- three months to even get to that point. Wow. The three months is pretty fast. So considering, you know, you didn't have any insurance sales background. You you can do a lot of things when you have no alternative. You know, right. it was a it was a large agency I had bought. And so there was so much pressure. It was like either you're gonna make this work, like your back's against the wall, like you're gonna be successful or you're gonna be bankrupt. Like these are your two options. Right. So <laughs> and then you made a financial commitment because you bought that large book of business. Yeah. Yeah. What what made you um be able to commit, you think, to the insurance business without, you know, really being in it first, you know, what, what made it? Uh, I had good right? mentors um, and they had really taught me um, during that process. They had, we kind of walked through some of the metrics and the basics on P&Ls and cash flow. And one of the things I've told a lot of people is if you, if you're buying something, there is more debt if you buy something large. But there's a safety net to it. There's an aspect of safety to it, which is you have larger cash flow. And larger cash flow can actually help kind of give you more runway while you are learning. If you have very restricted, very limited cash flow, you can run out very quickly. You have to move fast. If you have a larger cash flow, while it does come with more debt, you do have a little more revenue, a little more time to figure out what's going on um, and to have that ramp up time to get organized, successful. So um and there wasn't a ton of books for sale. It was like a 20 year agent. She just happened to be retiring. It was one of the things that was worked out perfectly. Mm-hmm. Um, I was the first person to talk to her. I was willing to pay what she wanted. And so that's what we went with. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And it's actually like the bigger, you would think the bigger the agency and the bigger the debt, the bigger the risk, but it's actually less of a risk because it gives you more time. So if you buy a smaller agency, then you have to figure things out faster. Um, so if you, you only have five grand of net cash flow coming in or you have 20, you have more room to make mistakes. You have more room to start with a couple of experienced staff that you can beg to please teach you what you're doing or what mm-hmm. you should be doing, you <laughs> yeah. know? So, <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's so cool. Um, so you grew it still. Yeah. Yeah. We, it took us a little bit to get going. Once we figured out, we invested heavy in the growth and um, we staffed up hard. I mean, I went, um, it's very similar to how farmers is. And so um, there was like some monthly bonus, there's like an annual bonus. And so I treated that the same way I treat what I do now. So we, we added staff, we started selling internet leads. We created a lot of the training that we do today. We began training every morning, five days a week for 30 minutes. Like we still do to this day. Um, and we just invested heavy into growth. Tell us a little bit about the training, the 30, 30 minutes a day. Yeah. So we train on, there's a talk path, whether it's auto or home. So we train that the staff memorizes it. And then we train on um, quoting objections, closing statements, closing objections, hot buttons and rebuttals. So all the things that you're going to hear on the phone. So there's, we always say like, there should never be anything to hear on the phone that surprises them. Nothing that knocks mm-hmm. them off because there's like, you know, 10, 12 things you can possibly hear in a day. And uh, we just believe that doing it every single day, it takes that repetition so that whenever you hear it on the phone, you don't think it just comes out. So uh, like in auto insurance, one of the examples we use is someone will tell you all the time, hey, just like, I'm busy, just email it over to me. And so the response they train on is, I can definitely do that for you. I just want to make sure it's personalized so the price is accurate. Is that a $500,000 deductible? So it's just simple role play like mm-hmm. that every morning. So, but it's a role play with each other. Yeah, they, so they pair up in the office uh-huh. and train every single day. Mm-hmm. What if the phone's ringing? So... We have it split sales and service. So they mm-hmm. get there at 830 and they train till nine and all the phones ring to service until nine o'clock. And then at nine o'clock, everything turns on. Gotcha. That's cool. All right. So you built it up still. Um, <laughs> and then what made you uh, made the decision to come to um, the right company? <laughs> <laughs> so I won't say anything disparaging. They've the, the direction of some of the insurance companies have changed. I fell in love with farmers. I met some of the management. I, I love the district I'm in. I uh, met my DM uh, here in Houston. She's incredible. Um, the opportunity to grow 
and the friendliness they approach agents with. I think sometimes maybe farmers agents don't realize because maybe they've been in it for a long time. The environment here is extremely pro-agent. A lot of carriers are not pro-agent right now. Um, farmers are extremely helpful about what they want to provide in order to let the agents grow. And um, the contracts were good. The comp plan was great. So um, I came in, I bought a, a small book, and we've just been focusing on growing that aggressively. And um, we will continue to grow as fast as possible. And if there's a chance to uh, do an additional acquisition at some point, we'll definitely be looking into do that too. Awesome. Yeah, that's really exciting. But yeah, I think um, one of the messages that you sent to me, you said, yeah, I like it here. It seems like they like agents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's just different. Like I said, they, they, they want to grow. They like the agent model where I feel like a lot of carriers are really moving to that 1-800, go help yourself. Um, it's not really that tr local agent, trusted advisor. And even us, like we are in Houston, we sell, we market the entire state of Texas. We don't just sell right where we're at. We sell the entire state, but we're still an agency where you can call, you can speak to the same reps. They're going to know you by name. They're going to have your information. You know, it's a much more personalized approach than a 1-800 number, which is where a lot of the carriers have gone. Yeah. No, I'm glad you mentioned that because I came from a different company too. And I just felt like agents were very appreciated, you know, and valued, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and our opinions mattered. And, you know, so uh, maybe if you're right. If you've been with um, the same company for so long, you don't really uh, maybe take it for granted or you don't see the other side. But I'm glad you feel that way because I definitely agree with you there. Sometimes it's like the grass is greener effect, I think. Mm -hmm. But if you've been to the other pastures, then you're like, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, the other pastures, you know, one, one of the things we talked about, too, um, was – you know, part of me is so, you know, or very much of me is very proud that I'm a farmer's agent and, we're, you know, we're helping out the community. But at the same time, my competitive nature makes me feel like, wow, how come agents over there, there's just so many like just monster agencies. Yeah. And, you know, what are your thought process on like, how come, you know, we don't, farmers doesn't have those type of, you know huge agencies, mm -hmm. you know, 30 million, 40 million book of business size. So I think that one of it, one of the things go to who they're bringing in to hire. And I think some of that plan is sometimes I think um, the idea of, I call it like the LSP agent can be sold where it's like someone who's going to maybe work the book and sell and talk to customers forever and have two or three staff. And that's kind of the model that's sold where I think some of the other carriers sold a model of, hey, you can be a business owner. You can grow this, you can buy this. And think of it like a machine, a top-down company within a company, right? Mm -hmm. And so first of all, the, the type of people you would approach for that opportunity are two different individuals. There's like, you know, there's operators and there's integrators. Um, and the second thing is really the structure of how you're allowed to merge or buy agencies really matters. Yeah. So the opportunity to buy, um, I know like with all state, I was in territory four, which is just considered Houston. So you could buy anywhere in territory four. So there's probably 300 agents in the, in the territory. So you had a lot of opportunity if you wanted to buy something where I know like typically farmers has not split into districts. So you might have three, four or five districts in a city. So I think your buyer pool is a lot more limited. So you probably have a little bit harder time doing some of those acquisitions. Um, and that could probably stunt some of the growth or it might just take longer for people to reach that level. So I'd say the first thing is, the model that's being sold and the individual who likes that model that's being sold and then probably some of the acquisition opportunity. Gotcha. Yeah. The acquisition opportunity is probably huge. Do you, what are your thought process on how to look out for that? Just kind of see what's going on with the district or have a good relationship with the district manager. Or? <laughs> I think that a lot of it comes to you because there's going to be, you know, maybe a smaller number of opportunities you want to really not approach the business selfishly, like you're your own business, right? And so we have to grow and do what's right for us. But like building rapport with the district, asking like, hey, how can I help? Like, what are the the goals for the company? Is it more auto? Is it more life? Can I help with that, right? Um, what does the district need? Do they need some mentorship? Would it be helpful if I had some protégés, right? Like actually having a working relationship. So when that time comes and a great opportunity pops up and you go and have that conversation, I'd love to talk about, you know, maybe buying this agency, they're a lot more likely to meet you there because you've not only done a good job as a business owner, you've been a good partner for farmers. Well, 
Yeah, that's huge. That's great. Um, great tips there, Josiah. So yeah, let's uh, talk about your growth. You know, I mean, I, I guess it helps that you already had a big <laughs> book of business. You know, all yeah. three years and growing a big, bigger, big uh, book of business into an even bigger one. But to share share with us some of your numbers, which you have short to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, because you're yeah, you're off to a hot start, and uh, w- what's really been helping. Yeah, so we're we're doing um, typically like three hundred thousand in, in premium a month. So um, we are in towards the end of May, and I'm not sure about Craft Lake, but I know like in farmers' business, we're like about one point two million year to date. New business. So um, in new business, yeah, yeah. one point two million new new written business year to date. So in five months, I guess. Um, so we've had we've had good success there. We are very lead centric. We do. <sighs> without getting crazy technical, right? I call it like online consumer data because there's internet, which is like data leads and there's live transfers and we do work a mix. Um, I typically spend 3000 per sales producer per month. It's kind of my budget per person. Mm, okay. Um, that's, and that's Texas is a high right? premium state. Yeah, Texas is a high premium state. So our focus is getting every producer to sell at least 60000 a month. That's kind of their mm-hmm. number they need to be at. And so kind of with our close rates, we've figured out about three grand per person is what we need to do. Um, and so it's the willingness to invest in that, right? Like when I first started, I wasn't profitable by any means, but I always joke, I'm like, hey, I'm long-term greedy. Like this business mm-hmm. is about renewals, right? So if I can, I don't, I'm not worried about making money at um, the time of new business at the, at the point of sale. I'm looking to make money on all the renewals. So we stack as fast as we can. We grow as fast as we can. Um, and then, you know, every March or February or January, as it rolls around and all that's renewing, again, you're just getting raise after raise after raise. Um, but you have to be willing to invest in the initial and not be worried about, you know, taking all your profit up front. Yeah. But you started, you bought the book of business understanding that. So you did that since day one. And we went in hard. And so, you know, I've had people say, well, you know, you had, you know, revenue coming in, I'm like, yes, but I still made no money. <laughs> I reinvested every dollar. Actually, um, with Allstate, what I did was even at that size, I got a $150,000 line of credit and I maxed it in order to use 100% for marketing to make sure we hit our annual bonus that year. So we've always been pretty risk on with how we do it. Wow. Do you think that's just how you are like just, you know, DNA wise, or do you think that's something that you learn to be a little bit more risk taking as a business owner? I think, well, I think a lot of it's probably personality, but I think it's also looking at your comp plan. So um, I think if you're, you know, if you're a career agent, you have the NBA, the new business accelerator, right? There's opportunities like that that farmers provides. So for us, it's like, man, let's say you do a hundred thousand in written premium, you get 10 grand in commission. We'll give you another 10 grand if you max your NBA. So now you're at 20. So I'm like, I'm getting an extra $10,000. So then you start going, well, how much can I put in to take advantage of this while we have it, you know, because we got the annual bonus and now we have the NBA or maybe you're scratched here on the retail program and it's effectively 40% your first year, you know? So I'm like, good Lord, how much can we possibly throw at this thing in the first year or two while we're getting these giant commission rates? We're going to have to scale down as we go. But those are places I would go very heavy in the marketing. If you got to take a line of credit, whatever, I would invest like crazy to take advantage of those opportunities because most carriers are 10 and 10. So if you have a chance to get 20 and 10 or 40 and 10, <laughs> um, yeah. you want to make sure you're putting the money there while you can. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just so, so important to get off to a good start. But mm-hmm. yeah, I've learned that the hard way. One time I missed out on a bonus and I was like, hey, if I would have spent like you know $10,000 more on leads, then I would have made like twenty thousand dollars more. You know, You're like, wait a minute, this math isn't good. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> looking back, I, okay, I gotta take accountability. Why didn't I hit it? You know, yeah. For some reason, I just had like this ceiling of how much I should spend on marketing. Mm-hmm. But I think the way you break broke it down, I think that's great. Where you look at it per producer. Well, and yeah, and so again, we're like, I'm like, man, like, how much can I spend, and what do they need to write? So if I'm spending, you know, my three grand a person, and I can get them to sixty thousand a month with our close rates, I'm like, all right, I can break even. So then it's like, how much can I possibly funnel into that? Because between the new business and that bonus, that NBA, I'm going to be reset to zero. I'm not going to make a dollar. I'm not going to lose a dollar. So how much can we possibly put in and grow this month? Because I know May of next year, of 2023, I'm getting a pay raise because we wrote so much, right? Just kind of investing with that mindset. 
Yeah, if there's an investment where you put money in and you don't lose any money, you just keep it there and next year it grows. <laughs> <laughs> well, you <know? laughs> you want to put as much money as possible in it. But a lot of agents don't want to think like that. They're like, yeah. hey, like I need to make money if I'm going to invest. I need to make money now. And it's like, mm, that's not really what this, this business model is about. This business model is about renewals. Why we're here. We're here for passive income, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Yeah, the understanding the comp plan. That was a great point right there. I think it, it, then, you know, even though you may be a little, you know, your risk tolerance may be different, but looking at the data and looking at, but, you know, there's so many different things that have to work out. And I think one of mm-hmm. them is the producer and the closing yeah. ratio. So that's where the training comes into play. But um, what are your thought process on how many people do you have to go through to find that 60K producer or, you know, yeah. above average producers, below average producers? How, what's your thought process on getting your producers to get be able to get there? Besides yeah, the Barton Elise, which is, you know, key, but. That's a that, good question. Because I think like the talent, matters so much and so um, i do run like a split system so we call like hybrids or sales and service together so i have a service team and i have a sales team and my service people they're like uh, to use like an ideal traits personality assessment language they're like my networkers and my nurturers my my service team you know they care about the relationship they're soft-spoken probably they're very sweet my salespeople are not <laughs> love them all dearly. They're um, Killers. my A types, my drivers, my sales leads, you know, mm-hmm. um, and they're the people that don't get flustered getting told no on the phone when they're calling, you know. So the first thing I think is like finding the right personality fit. A lot of people just get someone with a pulse or they get someone who's mm-hmm. done some selling. And I'm like, if someone's always done 20 K, it's going to be really hard to get them to 60. Mm-hmm. But if they're a, uh, top performer at their agency and maybe that looks like 35 or 40 then you can probably you know move them from good to great there can probably be a conversation there um i do focus on people who already have experience in the industry that's just been my model i've always kind of seemed to be in a hurry um and so i've always tried to shave off the time of getting them licensed and i feel like if they already are doing pretty good in the business then my chances of making them great are much higher than someone who has no experience, no license, because it's going to take me three months to even get them in the door licensed before I can start training to then tell if they're going to be good. So we're big on the personality types. We're big on looking for people with some level of insurance experience. Um, and then, you know, when you have, do you do have a team, which you like you do of established people. And you've probably got some really good high performers, you can bring people in and you can show them the standard. Hey, here's the average. Here's what's possible. And if you have five people doing that and you have one person who's always doing 50%, then you know you got the wrong person in the wrong seat, you know? Um, if no one was making their numbers, that's a me problem. But if 90% of the people are making it and 10% aren't, that's a them problem, right? Because we have mm. the tools, we have the coaching, we have everything in place. So focusing on the personality types, looking for that talent that already has some experience. And then bringing them in and train them every single day. It's two and a half hours of training a week for however long you work for me. It never stops. So if you do all those things and everyone else is performing and a certain individual isn't, it's pretty, pretty confident within 90 days is kind of my timeline that they're the wrong fit and we move them out. Well, yeah, I was going to ask you that 90 days is, you, do you need that much time? You think, or you typically don't. You can probably <laughs> tell if you have those. You can probably tell us in thirty days. But ninety days is like the max if you want to give someone a chance. Then they moved out before then. But t- literally within like thirty days, especially if you're you're training every day and they're on the sales floor. If you're throwing them in with all those people, you'll get feedback from your regular producers. You'll mm-hmm. talk to them. Hey, how's so and so doing? I seem really nervous on the phone. Oh, really? Yeah, they, they're sweating when they ask for the clothes or whatever, you know, or you're going to get, man, they're a killer. They're doing 150 calls a day. They're trying to close everything like you, you, you can figure it out pretty fast. Yeah. So when you say move them out, does that mean go to the service department or, or sometimes I don't even? No, no, I typically no, I typically won't because it's back to like that personality thing. We uh, we typically if they're if it's a person who's more built for sales, if it's not a good fit for us, I'm probably not going to have one on the service side. Because again, even that customer service side, it's very intentionally hired for. I want people who we always say, like, I want the sales side to run like a call center. Mm-hmm. And I want the service side to run like a mom and pop shop. That's mm-hmm. kind of the mentality we have. Mm-hmm. So they're doing a lot of calls on the sales side. It's go, go, go. On the service side, I want them to manage the phone. I want them to have notes remembering who their grandmother is, that their kid graduated last year, build that mm-hmm. relationship, you know? So it's two really, really different personality sets. Gotcha. 
Yeah. So um, that's awesome. Do you, how does your agency break down as far as staff size, how many in service and how many in sales? And do you have anybody doing both? I don't have anyone doing both at this time. Um, right now I have four in sales and three in service. And then we brought on a full-time life guy um, because we want to kind of make life a, a big focus this year. And um, at Allstate, they have what was called an EFS, an exclusive financial specialist. And they would do life. They would do investments. They were securities licensed. So I was kind of used to that model. And this guy I just brought in is actually a former EFS for Allstate. And I okay. knew him and he would, it wasn't liking it. So I recruited him over here. So he's come on to kind of handle life full time. So he's working all the tee ups from the sales and service team and working all that. Yeah, that, that makes your life numbers a lot better than probably training four of them to do a, a little bit of dabble into it. Huh? Just have one person really focus in it. I've done that and it's hard and Maybe I could have done a better job, but it was always like pulling teeth because we're yeah. so focused and we're so focused auto home, auto home. That's what we do. It's what we specialize, what we train in. And then to try to get someone to sit on the phone while they collect medical records or like get their blood work scheduled for the third time was just so outside the producer's wheelhouse. Yeah. It takes a special person to be able to do both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, having this someone specialize in that line of business, I think is a great idea. We've always believed in specialization. And mm -hmm. so like we do like the sales is the auto and home customer service is a retention and service life is the life. And then one of the future goals is to move more into doing some commercial, but like one of my goals there would be to try to go out and find a producer, maybe on the independent side who has commercial experience, who has that more detailed, but still, still salesy mentality and bringing someone like that in. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff, Josiah. Really awesome. Now, when you say you prefer, and I've been, leaning towards this way too to find people with a little bit of experience that way they kind of see a little bit difference of how each agency is and they kind of appreciate your the opportunity a little bit more if they have mm -hmm. uh, insurance experience in different places uh, or and just you know basic product knowledge and you know just you save time with the licensing process so I prefer that too but I bet a lot of people are saying like well it's impossible to find somebody that are looking <laughs> that are good and already licensed you know so yeah. what are your recruiting tips when it comes to finding someone that um, is already, you know, uh, somewhat of a, you know, insurance agent, like a professional mm -hmm. insurance agent that is, um, uh, has a little bit of experience and expertise. That's not easy. So, right? yeah, I mean, I, so that kind of falls, there's certain things that I'm responsible for recruiting is one of my jobs. Um, and so I treat that almost the same way we would treat any sort of sales. So I have subscriptions and memberships on basically every recruiting source out there from, Zip Recruiter to was it Glassdoor, indeed, all of them, right? And what I'm doing at all times, literally my first hour of my day, is I'm going through as new resumes update. You can get alerts and posts, and I'm going after those people first hour of the day. I have templates built out to hit salespeople, templates to build service people, looking for people with all state resumes, state farm resumes on every source, every site I can find online. I have those built out and I go after them. And what we do is if they respond, a lot of times, if once they respond, they may be interested, it gives you their contact info and all of that kind of goes in my funnel. And I've got cell numbers and emails and we will <laughs> do that constantly, even if we're not hiring, uh -huh. because it's so hard to go from not looking, no pipeline to, oh my God, I need a rock star by next week. Right. So we're always just like kind of building that pipeline and like they're phenomenal. Keep them in. They're phenomenal. Awful, awful, mm -hmm. awful, awful. Take them out, you know, so that we always have something to go to and pull on. And it's not easy. Um, my current sales manager, it took me over, over 200 resumes to find him, but he averages 70 to 2000 a month. Wow. He runs my sales team. He trains them and he's in charge of all the compliance. So like, I'll go through 200 resumes to find them, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and he came from an independent. He ran a team at a, at a large independent agency. So that's kind of my thing is I treat it like sales. Mm -hmm. I'm on every site you can find. I spend an hour a day, even when we're not looking to hire. Um, because I always say you can't afford to not hire great talent. Even if you're not looking, <laughs> you can't afford to not hire great talent because they can move your business so dramatically. So um, we're always looking. We always have a pipeline going. Absolutely. That's a great one. I mean, I, I hope everybody is listening right now taking notes because, um, yeah, that one hire could just change your business trajectory so much that it's worth. And I think another important you know, thing that I'm noticing is that you're very consistent with your uh, activities. So when it comes to salespeople, they're trained every single day, 30 minutes. 
And with your duty, you do it every single day for an hour, no matter what the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're very process, you know, oriented, um, whether it's like how many calls we do or how we do our training or how we do our follow up or how I do my job. Um, consistency wins, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things like, and you'll see it be like, I need to hire someone and they'll spend eight hours for three days trying to recruit. And they're so burnt down. Like all these candidates are awful. I'm like, yeah. And that's miserable. Or you could just spend 30 minutes an hour every day, no matter what, just log in, check your email, go through some resumes, hit some interested ones, carry on about your business. After like six months, you got a whole bunch of potential people that really could have some good talent. Yeah. Hey, just like working out, right? Just a little bit. Just of Just like of the working day. out. You yeah, get yeah, yeah. Results six months later. <laughs> you do one four-hour workout, doesn't do that much. But you go every day for an hour, it makes a difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about on the service side? What type of process-driven systems do you have there? So very similar as far as the recruiting side goes, looking for differences in resumes, more around the customer service. As far as the training goes, we do uh, training a little differently. They don't meet every day. They do meet once a week and they go over a lot of the issues that we see. We always look for trends. So a trend to us is five things. So if we find like five instances of something that something needs training on or something we can improve, we're always looking for a process we can tweak. So one of the uh, most recent ones was we do a decent amount of home. And so producers would, sales producer would deal with a home inspection, maybe something come back, have to be adjusted. And they weren't leaving notes in Apex, right? And it was mm-hmm. like, so service member came to me and was like, here's five instances of inspections where no notes were left. And so we're not sure how to help them because we don't know where they left off. So then like perfect training opportunity, right? Something we can improve on. So that's our Thursday thing. Then we sit down and we're like, hey, we need to focus on notes in Apex. Here's a trend because here's five times we've had it happen. So here's a coaching opportunity. So we do our Thursday meetings with the service team and we train all that stuff. Nice. Nice. So I know a lot of agencies are set up that way, but I want to know like how, to what extent is, are they separated? So do the sales customer service team, they get a referral or if they do a cross sell, would they pass them on to sales or would they keep that within the service team and try to close? They them? have the option. They can pass it on to sales or they can write it themselves. And here's what's funny. When you're working with like strictly customer service people, almost none of them want to write it themselves. They want to give it to the salesperson and then because they don't want to sell something and they want to go back and have a really nice conversation with Susie or whoever that they know so well that has a billing issue. So they have the option to write it. And uh, I have a couple who will, one will do about 10,000 a month normally through some referrals and stuff, but the majority of them, they just want to pass it on and go back to what they're doing. And so the way the office is set up, um, we have some at the front and then customer service has their own offices. Mm -hmm. And then my sales team has a sales floor. So it's like a cased opening. So it's not closed off, but it is a cased opening and it's a private room. And they have workstations in there and all the salespeople work in the same same general facility. Okay. So it's pretty divided location mm-hmm. uh, physically. Mm-hmm. Where Plus they're allowed. My salespeople are allowed. Yeah. So um, <laughs> we always joke like they need their own space over there anyway. What about the sales side? Like did they get a customer service call? Is it a transfer situation or is it, it is. Uh, and so, or is yeah. the phone routed to go separate ways? Yeah, so with our um, CRM, literally what we do is once we've marked it sold after seven days, because we kind of figure any new business items will be taken care of in seven days. After seven days, we have a route and it ring into the um, service team from there and becomes a service issue. Oh, so, th- so there's a client, they don't have to press one or two. It recognizes that it is a, a existing client and it sends it to the right people. That's how we do it. Because it's wow. like the first week, so if like an ID card didn't get sent or like, double checking on a dock or uh, maybe an inspection thing, whatever, there's a question around it. Let the salesperson handle all the new business issue. Once it's no longer a new business issue, everything that service going forward from there becomes the customer service team to handle because they're better equipped and that's what they're Mm -hmm. specifically trained to do. And I want the salesperson back on the phone for new business um, versus, you know, changing out a car or something like that. Right. Well, that's a smart CRM. And then if it isn't in, or if it's like a quoted or pending contact situation, then it'll go to the sales team. That's correct. What if it's uh, no, n- that number doesn't exist in the CRM? So all of our leads, the way we do them, they post directly in. So the data comes in before they're even called. So that should never happen. And okay, um, yeah. once the salesperson quotes it, they own it. So no one else can access the lead, only that salesperson. So they have direct contact back and forth. Oh, okay. That only one particular agent? Correct. So once, so it's like once 
whenever no one's talked to them, it's free game. Mm-hmm. Once someone's okay, made yeah. contact and done a quote with them, right, right. then they own that lead. It kind of comes out of the pool. Um, and so only them and that person who quoted can have that conversation yeah. now. Yep. Gotcha. That's how we like to do it too. Yeah. It's like yeah. shark tank and then ownership once quoted. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't want people trying to steal each other's thoughts. Yeah. 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 <laughs> then, then, it becomes, a, then it becomes a war, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're already aggressive have, enough. Last thing we yeah. need is fighting over leads. Yeah. A little bit, but you don't want them yeah, to fight in too much. <laughs> Yeah. All right, cool. No, that's awesome. And you use Ricochet, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We use Ricochet. So um, if you're familiar with it, it's like, yeah, there's no ownership when they first come in. And then once you, you know, quote them or whatever, you own it, it moves out of that shark tank. You have private ownership or whatever. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic CRM. There's a ton of automation features to it. And so um, it's been very helpful back on systems and processes. It's been mm-hmm. very helpful on <laughs> yeah. um, how we work our leads. Yeah, a lot of big, big time agents are using them. So if you don't mind asking, like, can we go a little bit into comp plan? Because when I hear yep. the service people saying that, hey, they even would rather send it out, that means their comp plan is probably different, right? Their comp plan is different. So their, um, their salary, and then they can get commission. And what we do there is, um, do you guys have access to foremost in California? Uh, foremost signature? Not yet. No. Not yet. Okay. Yeah. So we, we do right now. And so one of the things they can do is that they have a situation where the um, there's a large rate increase, something like that, a renewal. They can rewrite that maybe from mm-hmm. farmers to foremost, or if we're in Houston, maybe move it to a craft lake and they can save that. And they get paid commission on that because it's saving the customer. So it's a cancel mm-hmm. rewrite, but because it's saving, we don't have to grow that piece of business. So they earn commission opportunity there. Mm-hmm. And then the salespeople are salary plus commission. And it's uh, tiered by premium. So like 30 to 40,000 a month would be one tier, 40 to 50, 50 and up. So it's it's tiered based off that. And then it's a percentage of the premium that they sell also. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So the rewrite is um, not like you're not like the highest tier or like, is, is that at the lowest tier of what a salesperson? It's, it's literally the middle tier. Yeah, oh, it's, it, okay, it's, it's nice. the middle tier. And the reason we do that is we wanted something that would be enough that would incentivize the service team mm-hmm. to go ahead and save that customer because it's not a new sale. It's it, it's helping existing customer. They're usually really happy to do it because they're really helping. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it gives them a chance to earn commission in addition to um, their salary. And it's great for the agency because um, I think last month we uh, canceled rewrote like 24 grand. That's 24,000. We don't have to sell in order to grow that, right? Net mm-hmm. savings of 24,000 we would normally have to grow. We could have lost. So it's it's a big help to everybody. Yeah. Because that goes into the new business numbers for our agency, huh? Does it? It does. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And it's yeah. um, you may lose it out of farmers and some craft like or wherever, but again, you're saving that customer. Yeah. So you you know it's um it's a net positive because you didn't have mm-hmm. to write it in order to grow it. Yeah, and you know we want to do what's best for our clients. Exactly. You know, we have different rating systems, so we want them to always feel like we're always looking out and giving them the best. Uh, you know. Uh offer we could give them at all times. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the benefits of having farmers. I'm like, man, we have farmers and Bristol West and foremost specialty and foremost signature. And if you're in Houston, that area, we have some craft, like some of our brokered options for home. So I'm like, we have multiple cares we can quote you with to make sure we're getting you the best rate possible. It's an accurate statement. In the Houston area, the home prices, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not right? cheap. <laughs> Don't you have to get like um, the wind cover separately and stuff like that? Or a lot of Houston, you do. Um, we do. We do a decent amount in Houston. We do a lot. Um, we do a lot across the whole state. And yeah. so, one of the things we focused on was really um, marketing the entire state, and then trying to figure out what was farmers' appetite, where they want to be. I think a lot of agents get stuck. It's like I'm in orange so i can only market in orange when it's like mm, you get the whole state and maybe farmers is super competitive in san francisco i don't know mm-hmm. um and that's where you can put more marketing dollars so we did a lot of market research where we were doing the entire state and then examining close rates and trying to figure out where's our appetite and mm-hmm. then even where's our appetite for what carrier because farmers may feel differently on some places than foremost fields mm-hmm. you know so we have some options how, how do you look at where do you look at the data when it comes to that kind of stuff so what I do is whenever we sell a lead in, in Ricochet, it moves it to sold. And then I export all of our sold leads every couple months. 
and I put it in a heat map. And this is, a free, I think, a free service for anyone who wants to use. It's called Mapline, M-A-P-L-I-N-E. It's just a website. Mm-hmm. And you can drop zip codes in there, and it will heat map everything for you. And it'll wow. show zip codes, heat map. And so it'll light up and show you, hey, here's areas you're super competitive. Here's places you're not winning, whatever. So we measure that on a 30, 60, and 90-day mover and make adjustments. Wow. That's awesome. And... um. Yeah, just for all the listeners out there, okay. Uh, this is just for them. <laughs> what are the vendors you use? Because I know that's that's the secret. That, that's gonna solve it, all the problems, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gonna solve all the issues. So um, we we use we use a lot of vendors, honestly. Um, and I don't say that to be great. We we do use AllWeb. We do we have used Smart Financial. We do use Quote Wizard. We've used EverQuote. Um, one that everyone may not be super familiar with. I think you had Justin on there. It's Quote Hound. Uh-huh. Um, I know Jeff and Justin. I use Ace Quote Hound for a lot of our stuff. Um, you want to work with a good lead vendor, but what you really want is to have a really good relationship with your lead vendor. Mm-hmm. I am amazed at how poorly <laughs> people will treat their lead providers. Mm-hmm. They'll cuss them up and down, and then they'll be like, they suck, and they won't answer my calls. Yeah, and they return it. They buy six (laughs) and return six. You know, I'm like, okay, what, you know, um, where we've spent years, literally years, buying a lot of leads, working on relationships, developing friendships, having transparent, clear, but respectful communication around here's my numbers, here's what the trends that we're seeing. Can you all make adjustments? I pay. 15% 15% of what I used to pay for the same leads because of the relationships in the tenure. Wow. And on top of that, I can call usually on their cell phone. I can send them data and I can, we had the big conversation their day progressive. I think it, they had a loss ratio in Q4 of 132%. They were the industry's largest buyer of online consumer data of internet leads. They went to zero after Q4, zero. Wow to offset their loss ratio to slow down growth. So what that did was so many vendors' revenue dried up temporarily. So mm-hmm. it strangled our volume. And we had a lot of crap came through the filters. And so I'm like having a conversation. So then they're calling me, hey, this is what's going on. Our revenue disappeared. Our largest buyer backed off. We're scrambling to make adjustments. Let's try this as a pivot. Let's try these. Let's try some transfers while we kind of figure this out. So having the relationship really matters to be able to mm-hmm. call them and then to be able to help and coach you through all that. But they won't if you mistreat them. There's no reason to. Right. Um, do you distribute your marketing budget pretty evenly within the vendors? Or I mean, how and how often do you look at the data because and look at their performance and make adjustments there? Constantly. So one of my other, so like I do like a lot of the recruiting. Other job is marketing. So I'm looking at a seven day mover. Doesn't tell you much, but you're looking at a little bit. This is all wow, on Ricochet. Seven days, wow. seven days. I'm looking at two weeks. I'm looking at four, and then my mature data is a three month mover. But that's a really long time with how volatile things are right now with rate increases of all the carriers. So we're measuring every week, every couple of weeks, we're looking at that. And I'm almost always taking that data and sending it to whatever lead provider I'm working with. This is what we're looking at in two weeks. Hey, here's the month. A good example, we had, um, I'll leave the vendor out, but we had a vendor, a couple channels of leads coming through. We were closing pretty decent percentage in February, dropped by half in March, and then by half of that again in April. So I'm like, guys, like, <laughs> here's the data. Mm-hmm. And so one, they gave me massive discounts. Two, they went back and changed a bunch of their aggregators they get stuff from. And three, we started adding in a lot of live transfers. I had a phenomenal result from them. Um, so it's tr- important to track that. And it's important to be in constant communication with them, showing them what you're looking at, which is back to the importance of the CRM. Because if not, you're just kind of guessing blindly. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. how are they doing? It's like, oh, they seem bad right now (laughs) you know (laughs) yeah and then i think the speaking of building relationship part i bet they appreciate the data too because they don't know what happens after they send it to you you know most people won't track and they actually love the data and Mm -hmm. they can come back and they can tell you hey like you're performing in the top 10 percentile of agents in texas or they can say it's weird you buy a decent amount but you're not doing well in comparison here's some of our other people look at their close rates Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Is that a reflection on our processes? Do we need to make adjustments? Or are we buying in the wrong area? Um, but it all goes back to like having good communication and respectful communication. Because mm-hmm. I just I, I hear all the time because people know we do internet leads. Like I don't know how you do internet leads. They're trash. 
I'm like, well, what, what, who did you buy them from? Up from this person and that person. How many did you buy? Bought 10. They were all bad. <laughs> like we buy, <laughs> we buy 10 every 20 minutes, you know? <laughs> that's so, like saying, um, you know, I did 10 push ups, they didn't work. That's a great example, right? <laughs> like, of course they didn't, <laughs> you know? Go buy 250, work them for four weeks, take your numbers, make some adjustments, have them look at the data with you. They can tell you, yeah, we're doing terrible in, I don't know, Dallas. But look how good you're doing in Austin. Let's move some marketing dollars over to Austin or whatever it is um, and let them go through that with you and help you. So you're looking at those numbers every day. Um, do you feel like most of your day is spent on looking at numbers or do you do a lot of um, talking to staff or do you do talking to clients or what, 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 what uh, you know, what, what does your typical day look like there? So mornings we come in, I usually do my resume thing. Sales manager runs the uh, sales training over there. I'm usually not client so, so facing. You, you don't do the sales training, huh? No, I used That's to do beautiful. it. And now he runs that completely That's for me. Okay. Um, and I used to be somewhat client facing. I'm really not client facing at all anymore. So a lot of what my time is spent is, yes, I'm looking at marketing. I'm talking to vendors and going through numbers. And then I try to carve out during the week to have like one-on-ones with my staff. And so whenever I do a one-on-one, it's usually not super performance-based. So it's not going to be like, here's your numbers or here's your talk time. It's more like a personal check-in. Like, hey, how's everything going? How's the week been for you? Hopefully you have a good relationship with your staff. You know, how's your how's your wife? How's everything with the kids? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's more of a conversation. It leads to work and performance. We can have some good coaching opportunities, but it's more relational. Um, pipeline check-ins are, are typically done by my sales manager. They do one-on-ones more on that side. But my day, again, it's like resumes, it's marketing, it's vendors. I might meet with my managers and go over like, hey, here's some general numbers. We just had a meeting yesterday going over. We need to bundle home more. We have a really good closing rate on home right now. We need to be pushing more on bundling the home, quoting the home every single time. We're not quoting it 100% of the time we do the auto. So here's some training opportunities or um, doing one-on-ones with the staff, just kind of building those relationships, getting to know them better knowing what makes them tick, what motivates them, how do I incentivize people, you know, what matters to them. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's uh once a week you try to sit down with them. Yep. Every person, at least once a week. Yep. Wow. Yeah. I just think 20 minutes. It's not bad. And he's in the office for 20 minutes, hang out. And sometimes those turn into an hour and there's a lot more going on than he knew about it. We had one staff. It was, trying to buy a house and then this happened with a relationship and the housing and they were super stressed and they were trying to make their sales to help cover the difference. And they were putting so much pressure, their sales were off pace and they didn't know what they were going to do. It's like, I didn't know this was going on, you know, like now we can have a real conversation about getting you back on your feet. That's a great leader, you know, that you do that and your availability for them. So uh, yeah, it's super important to get a pulse of uh, what your um, staff members are going through in life. And, uh, you know, offering them value to help them out in different ways too, yeah. by understanding their situation. But yeah, Josiah, I mean, <laughs> if people and farmers don't know your name, they're going to know your name. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you really know what you're doing. Uh, super impressive. Uh, the number speaks for themselves. You know, at first I was like, okay, I get a lot of, you know, comments from people or messages and people trying to connect and, you know, that, which is great. I love t- connecting with agents, but, you know, I, I, um, you're, you're on to big things. What's, um, some of the challenges you see coming up or what are your, um, you know, plans or um, about the future of your uh, agency? No, I think like general challenges are, it's a really weird time in the industry. Everyone's making adjustments. Everyone's taking pretty large rate increases. I think, you know, a couple of years ago, you were seeing three to 5%. Now you're seeing 12 to 18%. So it's going to be a matter of, really focusing on where we're competitive, really coaching our people to keep on quoting. It may cost a little more marketing dollars to win deals. It may take a few more quotes to win deals, depending on where we are in the cycle of up, down rate wise, you know? So we're gonna have to make those adjustments um, and keep everyone really mentally strong as we move through it. There's gonna be times that we're way more expensive than some people. And there's gonna be times we're way cheaper than some people. And so just kind of adjusting the marketing and the coaching and keeping everyone strong mentally to get through all that. as far as our stuff goes, we're going to keep on plowing ahead. We're going to keep on growing as fast as possible, take advantage of the NBA and the, the bonuses that Farmers is giving agents right now. And then I'll kind of keep my eyes open. If we can find other agencies to buy, I'll definitely keep on doing that as well. So need more revenue to support more growth, you know? Yeah. 
No, that sounds like an awesome plan. You know, we got to keep marketing, keep recruiting, you know, looking out for options to purchase uh, acquisitions. Uh, but yeah, um, I'm excited for your future, man. I mean, it's just uh, seems like you're just not even the whole, a whole year in, but <laughs> I guess your experience and um, yeah, you're already just completely in business owner mode. You know, not the self-employed insurance sales agent mode. You That's know. a good way to put it. Well, I think that goes back to, I have to give credit to people. You know, I was, I was, um, one of the reasons I, I said, yeah, let's do this, you know, because I feel like I was helped so much by having mentors in my life who are in the business, who took my calls when I was super stressed or showed me the ropes and not everyone has that. So I think your channel is fantastic medium. Probably come in and get some of that coaching or some of that mentorship because I mean, you don't know what you don't know. This isn't an easy industry to be successful in, but there are like proven processes that work if someone can coach you on them, you know? Um, so I think having a mentor or having a coach or having someone who can give you blueprints it makes a drastic difference in how fast you get to where you want to be. Yeah, for sure. Who, who are some people you want to give us some shout outs? I mean, the guy that got me into Allstate, his name was Steve Wolverton. Um, he was in for about 30 years. He was a fantastic agent. Um, I think he had, I can say this, he wouldn't mind. I think he had like a 25 or $28 million book of business, do a couple wow. thousand items a year. I mean, so having someone like that um, in your corner was mm -hmm. huge. We used to go to a conference called Mega. It wasn't an Allstate conference. It was an agent conference put on by agents, but you had to be either over 10 million in premium or writing more than I think 4 million a year in new business. Um, and they'd ask for copies of your stuff in order to attend. And so everyone who went was a rock star. And wow. they were there three or four days and sitting with those guys and seeing what they do on sales, hearing the panels on service and retention. I mean, one, you get fired up, but mm -hmm. two, it's like you have an entire book full of notes, <laughs> you know, these people that are doing that level of volume. I remember seeing a guy who moved from New York, he had a large agency in New York, he moved to Texas, had a huge staff he started with, and his, I thought we were doing really good. We were the number one ECP startup in Texas at first, and he showed up. He was phenomenal. And his first month, they wrote 602 homes <laughs> in a month. <laughs> as someone so, new in the state yeah like 600 homes in a month you know so i'm like all right calling them. i'm like all right brother what are you doing you know <laughs> so like i think like always like leveraging that and like figuring out like i reach out to you i'm like who's doing better who's doing bigger numbers call them get on zoom with them ask for 45 minutes at a time hey what are you doing that works so well matters yeah, doing the research, building the connections. And then you also mentioned if I'm going to any conferences that I didn't even know existed. So, so those conferences, I, mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad you brought that up, but you recommend them, huh? Yeah, yeah. I think it matters um, getting in getting in with some of those people. Um, and some of those, like they're they're pretty small. I think only about 80 people would go. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not big. So you kind of get to know everybody after a couple of years, but they would do panels and they would talk about sales, panels on service. They would have technology vendors out there. Hughes using what technology, how the industry is trending um, and just being surrounded by people and, you know, being able to put you know, yourself as a small fish in a big pond really is helpful because you start thinking, oh, I'm pretty good at this. And then you meet someone and they did a thousand items last month. You're like, oh, wow, I suck. Okay, <laughs> good. Okay, back to work. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, that exposure. And then, you know, just being around people that inspire you, you know, that's so important. Yeah. Um, not just the motivate, not just the, you know, technical skills that you can learn from them, you know, tactical, um, you know, strategies mm -hmm. and stuff, but just, mm -hmm. you know, uh, being able to think bigger by being around people like that. So you mentioned, you know, some mastermind groups and stuff like that. Let me know, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I learned a lot, you know, from talking to you this hour. I uh, really want to just acknowledge you for, you know, just, man, just what a great start, you know. And then um, as soon as you're eligible for PC, I'm looking forward <laughs> to seeing you there. And just, yeah, for uh, sure. yeah um, learning from each other, helping each other out, because that's what this channel is all about. Um, and um, just you know, super grateful and super happy that you're part of it now. Well, I appreciate it. And like I said, I, I love what you're doing because I've been fortunate to have some close at hand mentors, but not everybody's got that. So hopefully they're actually watching your videos and taking copious amounts of notes because you're basically giving a free blueprint online to how to make an agency work. And that's pretty valuable. Yeah, no, I'm just, you know, trying. Um, but sometimes when you, when you share, that's actually, you're reinforcing it to yourself. So I'm learning as I yeah. go too. So, 
um, like this one, you know, I'm, tr- I'm trying to help other people, but uh, trust me, I'm the one getting a lot of the benefit <laughs> from talking to you. So yeah, we'll keep in touch for sure, Josiah, you know, keep sharing your wins. Uh, we'll keep connected. And then, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the day we meet in person, but yeah, until then keep killing it, man. It's really happy to see, you know, people coming into the farmer's family and doing really well, uh, and really, um, showing the gratitude and showing other agents what, uh, this business is uh, all about and what's possible in this business. So we'll keep in touch. Looking forward to it. For sure. I appreciate you, Dan. Have a great rest of your day. All right. Good to you, Saya.